Actually, Srila Prabhupada brought me to Krishna consciousness. I had seen the devotees in Berkeley in the street. I'd given donations, bought magazines, taken prasadam, and so on. And seen the Hare Krishna festival in the Berkeley Hills. Uh, but then I went to see Prabhupada give a lecture <clears throat> in the International House of the Berkeley campus, the Uni University of California at Berkeley. And it was actually upon seeing Prabhupada there that I really became fixed on Krishna consciousness. I had seen other so-called swamis and religious leaders. Actually, for a sociology of religion class, I had to go and observe different religious performances and ceremonies, and I'd gone to, see a, I'd gone to see a swami. It seemed like he wasn't saying anything practical or substantial, telling people how to relax. <laughs> Just as Prabhupada, uh, he always says that uh, he was reluctant to go to see a spiritual master because he'd seen so many so-called sadhus. <clears throat> so in a, in a little way, uh, there's some similarity. But I went to see Prabhupada, and as soon as he entered the auditorium, I could see that this person is very different. His gravity, uh, his power, his demeanor, it, he seemed to be practically like, like a military commander coming in. Not in a, the a sense of uh, a violent person, <clears throat> or uh, anything like that, but just as authority. Here was a person I could see, obviously, that was filled with authority, and yet serene at the same time. So the program started, the devotees began to chant, Prabhupada got up off the Vyasa, Vyasa and began dancing, jumping in ecstasy. He was obviously an elderly person. That was in 1969, so he was uh, over 70 years old. So to see this holy person so much filled with authority, uh, over 70 years old, dancing in ecstasy, was quite overwhelming. One of the first observations, actually, that uh, struck me, uh, one of the things that I saw when I was first with him, after I'd seen it, joined him in Delhi, we uh, then went to Brindavan, and we were there for about 10 days. So I got a real chance to see Prabhupada in action. Uh, I was by that time I was able to live in his quarters and Prabhupada, the, the first instruction that he gave me was that now your only business is to be with me 24 hours a day. So I literally, I took that quite literally, uh, except of course when I was asleep, but um, I was with him day in and day out and I got the chance to observe everything that he did, um, everything that he spoke, uh, every little action that he did, and um, it really struck me very strongly that Prabhupada was like a living Srimad Bhagavatam. You know, in, in the Bhagavatam there's a dis full description there of what it means to be Krishna conscious. And of course there's volumes and volumes of books that describe that. And if you read them, then it might seem like, well, this is going to take a long time, you know, to realize what all of this is. It's such a vast subject. You know, what does it mean to be Krishna conscious? But it was all there in Srila Prabhupada, you know, at every moment. So I kind of, I saw that, I understood that, and I resolved in my mind that I would take as much advantage of the opportunity to see him as possible, that just by ob observing how he did everything, how he managed things, how he spoke, how he walked, uh, how he relaxed, uh, how he dealt individually with different people, you know, that that would show me the best example of Krishna consciousness. And, uh, you know, it, 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 it just really struck me. Prabhupada was like a living, breathing Bhagavatam. Everybody was singing Sri Guru Charana Padma, and Prabhupada was on the Vyasasan, and he was also closing his eyes and playing Kratal and singing. So I asked Lokanath Swami, uh, isn't this a song uh, in glorification of Prabhupada? And he said, yes. So I said, how come he himself is singing it? So he said, uh, he's singing it to his spiritual master. Because the day before, Lokanath Swami has asked me for putting my name for initiation. And I said, uh, let me, I will tell you, not yet. And after I heard this explanation from Lokanath Swami, I said, you write my name for initiation. Then he said, why suddenly now? 
you know so many books, you this, that and you always said wait, wait, wait and now you're telling. So I said yes, I'm telling because uh, I can see that he can be, he will be my spiritual master. This is an Hindi, way honge means he would be my spiritual master because when he is glorified, he is glorifying his spiritual master. So now I know that this is actually the succession. So you take my, you put my name for initiation. And my name was added, Swami Atmananda. And uh, I heard from other God brothers that Prabhupada, when he was looking at the names for initiation, he said, Bhakta this, Bhakta this, Bhakta that, and he said, Swami. So he said, who is this Swami? So someone told him, it's uh, a new Bhakta. So Prabhupada said, new Bhakta Swami? And then he said, all right, what's his name, Atmananda? So then Prabhupada said, Apashyatam Atma Tattvam Griheshu Grihamedinam. His name will be Atma Tattva. When I got initiated in Los Angeles, I got a little piece of paper with my name that said Hridayananda. And so for some reason, I, I can't explain it or justify it, when I got my paper, I thought it was Hari Dayananda, but someone that just left out the A. The secretary had written it wrong. Can't explain that one. So when people said, what's your name? I said, Hari Dayananda, which sounds like a perfectly good Krishna conscious name. In fact, it even means something in Sanskrit. So no one ever questioned me. No one ever said, that doesn't sound like a bona fide name. So for the first several months after I initiated, I was initiated, I was Hari Dayananda to the world, not to Prabhupada. In fact, there's an old Back to Godhead article by Hari Dayananda Das Brahmachari. Anyway, so I wrote Prabhupada a letter about, uh, probably about approximately a year after my initiation and signed it Hari Dayananda. And Prabhupada wrote back and said, Dear Hari Dayananda, please accept my blessings. By the way, your name is Hari Dayananda. <laughs> so, uh, I thought, how in the world would Prabhupada remember me? Then when I went to Gainesville, Prabhupada wrote a letter to some of the other devotees in the temple, the young devotees, and said, now, he said, Hridayananda is there, so I'm sure everything will go on nicely. And I was thinking, how in the world does Prabhupada remember who I am? So I was, I was amazed by that, I, because I, I had no real importance within the structure of ISKCON. I was just a young member, and I, I was amazed that Prabhupada remembered who I was. I think the, um, the quality of Srila Prabhupada that really touched me the most was just the fact that he was so warm and he was just so um, kind. It was such, I mean, he, from being with Prabhupada, you could immediately understand that he's, he had a genuine concern for your welfare. He was serving us, you know, he was putting himself out. Uh, in so many different ways, uh, just to give us the chance for spiritual life. And it made you want to reciprocate by just offering whatever service that you could to Srila Prabhupada. So it, there was a nice reciprocation going on, and I always felt very, very comfortable in Prabhupada's presence. Of course, there was the formal guru-disciple relationship, and one had to be careful not to transgress that. But at the same time, Prabhupada was very, very accommodating. He was a you know, wonderfully warm and, and humble person. And um, he always made you feel you know, wanted. He always made you feel you know, significant in some way, that he knew what you were doing and he was happy with it and he would encourage you. Because he would also chastise you at different times if you did things wrong. But that chastisement had the same effect as you know, his praise. It made you Christian conscious and you understood it was for your own benefit. It was never, you know, from any material kind of motivation. So that was the one thing that I stood out, always stood out in my mind with Srila Prabhupada was that he was very happy to be with us. He very much appreciated the fact that young men had given up the best part of their lives, was, you know, spreading the Krishna consciousness movement. And he always showed that appreciation. So then, on the initiation day, Radhashtami, um, before that for about two weeks, I had some uh, infection inside my mouth, so I couldn't brush my teeth properly. I was just gobbling with uh, water, 
hot water and salt. And Delhi temple, Rajapat Nagar, a very small room. It's a big Vyasasan. It's a fire is here, deities are here, fire is here, and Vyasasan is here, and Prabhupada sits at the tip of the Vyasasan like this. It's a big lotus asan. And I was like this close when I went to get the bead. So he's asking, Char Niyam Kya Hai? So I said, uh, no meat eating. And my mouth was like this close to his nose. And um, Prabhupada, he was sitting like this, in, uh, like that, and he opened his eyes. He looked at me and he said, Abdan Tik Se Saaf Kyo Nahi Karte? Why you're not cleaning your teeth properly? So I said, infection. So he said, infection. Then he turned around, took the bead from Gopal Krishnaji, gave it to me, chant 16 rounds. It was like, infection is the uh, observation and chant 16 rounds is his prescription. <laughs> and then he said, your name is Atma Tattva Das. They banged the Murdanga hurry bowl and I came and sat down. I, 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 I was not there, I was thinking. Something has happened to me. I got initiated. I have a bead and I have my guru and and I was completely emotional. So that evening, right in the lawn in front of the temple, Prabhupada is giving evening darshan. So I took the chamara, went to fan him so that I can be close. So I I'm most probably maybe I was doing a big number on the chamara, you know, those one of those you know, so and it, it was it's 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 a uh, radhashtami, it's cold. So he he was was feeling cold. So he looked at me like that. <laughs> so then I became so slow that the flies were sitting on his face. And again he looked at me like that while he was singing Radha Madhava. And I was so scared. <laughs> so I didn't know where, you know whether to go fast or to go slow. And, but still I didn't want to give up that because I wanted to be there looking at him. So he sings Radha Madhava and then he does Jayam prayers. And then, thank you very much. And then um, he looks at me like this and said, Material life is an infection. And there was like, you know, some big bulldozer on my head. <laughs> and then he puts his hand out, he lifts his shirt like this and he said, You scratch and you feel satisfied. Then he put his hand out again. You scratch more. You feel some satisfaction. And you scratch more. Then you stop. Not because you are satisfied, but blood comes. The rest of it I didn't hear. This line I just remember. <laughs> And I was there just moving like a machine, but I was going through my whole life and I was seeing that this person has gone into me and taken an x-ray report and given to me, yeah, that's what you are. Blood came. And that was very moving for me that he fought me exactly. And I have heard many di di disciples saying the same thing. He was seeing through me and he said to me, and I heard that before, and I was thinking that I had faith. I knew that happens, but you know, when it happens to you, it's totally different because <laughs> it's happened to you. <laughs> it's not somebody else. So I was completely like somebody went through me inside with a ray and came out, and uh, I was very happy. We were in Prabhupada's room uh, once. Oh, in the early seventies. I was sannyasi, so maybe 73, 74. And uh, Prabhupada, it was a beautiful afternoon. The sun was setting and golden rays were shining on Prabhupada. But it was very sublime. A nice breeze was blowing. It was a very beautiful atmosphere. And uh, Prabhupada took us back to old India, the turn of the century. And uh, when he was a child, when he was a young householder, and he took us there, actually, and he began to talk about how people used to work and relationships between uh, householders and their servants and how people used to cook and things. So there we were back in India with Prabhupada. And then he took us back farther to his early childhood when he was playing with, uh, not playing, but having the Rathiyatra 
and worshiping Radha Govinda. And then uh, only Karanda and I were in the room. The Prabhupada looked at us very strongly and said, uh, whatever I'm doing now, I was doing then. Do you understand? And of course, we were at that point kind of speechless. And then Prabhupada said, never was there a time when I did not know Krishna. Do you understand? And uh, he said it in such a way that it was clearly the case. <laughs> so that was a very powerful experience. <laughs> Whenever Prabhupada talked about anything, somehow or another, he could link it to Krishna consciousness and derive some kind of spiritual point from it. For instance, when we were in India, he would sometimes talk about the British rule in India and how they managed things. But he would always use that as a practical example for us, you know, how we should manage things. Um, sometimes he would talk about, you know, recent Indian history. But he would do it in such a way that he would point out how uh, a person was either acting, you know, in a genuinely spiritual way or whether it was just a mundane thing. Um, he would relate it to, you know, say the de degradation of Indian culture and why the Vedic culture was disappearing. Uh, whatever, but uh, Prabhupada had this unique ability to see Krishna in everything and to explain things in such a way that we could also see it. You know, he was always teaching and Prabhupada was very conscious of the fact that he was always teaching us <coughs> at every moment. He had, um, there was no private life for Srila Prabhupada. His life was a, the life of an Acharya, so it meant that he was, you know, in the spotlight, so to speak, at every moment of every day. And he was remarkably consistent. That was another feature also that I appreciated, was that Prabhupada's uh, absolute regularity in what he was doing always amazed me. You know, we traveled all around the world, and he would keep the same schedule, he would do the same things day in, day out, and be completely steady and, and not disturbed at all. And, you know, he would be up in the middle of the night translating his books, he would go out for his morning walk, he would take his massages, he would have his meals at the same time, no matter what, didn't matter where we were going. Now, I was suffering jet lag, you know, as we traveled around. Prabhupada seemed completely uh, impervious to it. It just didn't seem to affect him. He would just go right on. And as soon as we arrived in a new place, he would immediately be into his schedule, and that was it. He never showed any sign of, uh, you know, fatigue or disturbance at all. One big businessman, uh, he came and um, he was saying, Swamiji, I have uh, this factory here in Delhi and I have that factory in Zonpur. And he gave a list of his things and then he said, uh, uh, I have all this but I can't sleep. So Prabhupada looks at him and he says, that is why you can't sleep. You give all this to me, then you can peacefully sleep. So then he turns to uh, somebody who was sitting there and he said, I, I think it was Gopal Krishnaji. He said, uh, take his address. Uh, so this man says, uh, no, 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 no Swamiji, I, I can come anytime. Hey, you can come anytime, but we should also be able to come anytime. Take his address. And then he was ready, you know, so yes, yes. And say, no, 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 Swamiji, Prabhupada said, no, no, take his address. We will relieve you of your problem. You give some of these things to Krishna, then you will be peaceful. And he was like smashed right there. And uh, he did give his address. And he had to. We brought uh, Miss Mexico to see Prabhupada. You know, in those days we were young and just we thought any celebrity, let's bring them to Prabhupada. So we brought Miss Mexico and she came in. She was nice, you know, fluttering her eyelids, eyelashes. And uh, obviously she has all these, you know, Miss America, Miss Mexico, they spend their year just going around and doing events and, you know, getting their picture taken and smiling and saying a few nice words here and there. So she was more or less in that mood. She came with a few gentlemen. So as she sat in front of Prabhupada, she made her customary spiel. She said it was very nice being in Mexico, in Spanish I was translating. She said, I'm very glad to be here. I've enjoyed the program very much and, uh, you know, I hope to, hope to come again sometime. So Prabhupada said to her, why do you want to come again? In other words, he was uh, not at all concerned with the glamour of it all. 
he was very sober, and he said, why do you want to come again? And she couldn't really answer it. You know, no one ever asked questions like that to Miss Mexico. And he asked her very seriously, why do you want to come? Then Prabhupada, we had Prabhupada's books on a shelf. He said, have you read my books? She said, no. He said, then why do you want to come? Why do you, want, why do you say you want to come again? So she was caught without an answer, and uh, at that point she stopped being Miss Mexico and just started being a soul. So there was one time, um, it was on the appearance day, uh, disappearance day, sorry, of uh, Shula Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati. Uh, we were in Bombay, and this lady came for darshan in the afternoon. So she was a follower of another guru, and um, this man was a well-known Mayavadi. So during the course of the conversation, there was some discussion on the philosophy of the Bhagavad Gita, and of course this woman was espousing her guru's ideas of what the Bhagavad Gita actually meant. And especially there was one interpretation of Krishna, what Krishna meant. So of course in Sanskrit the word Krishna means dark. So this man had written in his commentary that Krishna means dark, dark means unknown, so the absolute is the unknowable um, supreme, unmanifest, like this. It was a, a Mayavadi interpretation. So Prabhupada uh, very quickly fired back that he said, well, if dark means unknown, if Krishna is unknown, then if he does not know Krishna, then why is he commenting on the Bhagavad Gita, which is Krishna's words? And he said um, that Actually, to the devotee, Krishna says, to the devotee, I am known. So he said, therefore, this man, because he's not a devotee, he cannot know Krishna. And only the devotees can actually comment on the Bhagavad Gita. So, <laughs> Prabhupada was very expert. He could pick out the flaw in anybody's argument immediately. And, of course, in India, you always got a lot of this kind of, uh, you know, different kinds of interpretations and, you know, false ideas and misconstruing, you know, the words of the Bhagavad Gita, but Prabhupada was very expert on uh, keeping a person focused that Krishna is the Supreme Personality of Godhead. When Prabhupada came to Gainesville in 1971, at the end of July, a wonderful visit, he was being interviewed. He arrived, he sat in the Vyasa we'd made for him, and uh, he gave a beautiful lecture, then he was taking questions. There was one girl there, I guess that was 1971, but at that time she was a young girl. And uh, in a somewhat challenging tone, she said to Prabhupada, I see that you have mostly young people here, why is that? So Prabhupada immediately shot back, why do you have mostly young people in your university? And she was so much caught off guard, I remember she actually dropped her pencil. And uh, she sort of, you know, groped for an answer, stuttering, and said, well, that, uh, that, that's the age of education. He said, yes, therefore, that is the age of Krishna consciousness. Now, there is such exchange like that. Where, uh, a few days before I took sannyas, Prabhupada was being interviewed by a reporter in his quarters in L.A., and he knew something about Hinduism. He said, well, uh, isn't it in India that old people take sannyas? Why are you giving sannyas to young people? So Prabhupada shot back, what does it mean to be old? The man had no answer. Prabhupada said, old means about to die. Can you say that I'm older than you? Can you say that you're not going to die before me? Who's, can you say? And he couldn't answer that. He said, therefore, we are giving them sannyas. I was um, um, cleaning the temple room in Lajpat Nagar, and um, this one old gentleman came, uh, and he was paying obeisances to the deities, and um, he said, uh, Krishna Guru Ayurapa, uh, this Guruvayur is a deity in uh, South India, in Kerala, and only Keralites and South Indians, they call the deity by that particular name and the accent. So I went to him and I asked him, are you from Kerala? 
He said, yes. And then we started talking in his language. My language is Tamil. That is Malayalam. So he, while we were talking and he found out that, you know, I am initiated by Prabhupada and all that. So he said, um, I want to um, become a disciple of Swami Prabhupada. And I asked here before, and they told me that I have to be six months you know, serving in the temple. And he lifted his dhoti and showed me his leg. It was swollen up with water. And uh, he was about, about 60 years old. He said, I was a railway officer. I retired and I have big problem with my legs. And uh, I cannot do those things that they are saying. And they said, if you cannot do, then you cannot become his disciple. So, uh, can you please do something, tell Prabhupada, so that he will accept me as his disciple? So I said, I am just become disciple, and the system is the temple president has to give you recommendation. And if the temple president has told you this, then there is no question of, you know, me doing something about that. But then I said, but you can do one thing, you can just go to Prabhupada himself and ask him. These are rules set by Prabhupada, but if he wants, he can do anything. So you may go and see him, he sees people every evening. So he said, uh, anybody can go. I said, well, it's free darshan, everybody is going. You come tomorrow and see him. Come early, so you'll be the first person. And I told him, you bring, a, you bring something for him. You bring a plate with some cloth, some coconut, some flowers, some sweets and some dakshina. And you bring and give it to him. That's our tradition. You know you're from Kerala. So he said, yes, 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 I'll do it. Next day, uh, he came with a big plate covered by a cloth. And it was only like 4 o'clock. Prabhupada starts giving darshan at 5, around 5. And uh, I told him, you wait here. They will tell and they will come. Then uh, just about 10, 15 minutes later, Hari Suri Prabhu looked down and said, if anyone is there, they can come for darshan. And he was the only person. So I said, look, you're so fortunate. There's nobody. Now you just get up and go there. And he was shivering. He was saying, well, let somebody come. I said, this you don't do. You want to get something done which is not normal. So you must be there as quick as possible. And get your thing done. So he got up and I came with him. He came, he put the plate on Prabhupada's desk and uh, Prabhupada looked at him like this and he said, yes. So this man, he was all like emotional and he had a bead bag and a bead on top of that plate and he was holding that like this and he said, he said Prabhupada, I want to chant Hare Krishna. So, Prabhupada smiled at him and said, So, who is stopping you? He said, Prabhupada, I want to chant Hare Krishna. <laughs> so, Prabhupada said, Is that your bag? He said, Yes. Prabhupada took that. And he said, Do you know how to chant Hare Krishna? So, he said, I know the mantra. And he said, Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Ram, Hare Ram, Ram Ram, Hare Hare. Prabhupada said, Yes. Took the bead out. And he did like this, comes to the head beat. And he said, you, you start like this. And he said, and every beat you chant the whole mantra, Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna. And Prabhupada went to the next beat and went to the next beat. And he chanted a whole round, just like this. And he, and he said, said, now you chant like he usually does when he gives the initiation. And I was so blissful, I thought this man is initiated without having to sweep the floor for six months, <laughs> etc. He could have never done it because he would die if he does that. Because he's got a, like, a, like a glass bottle like leg with water. How can he ever do anything like that? So I met this, I, I went to meet this man after some time uh, after traveling somewhere else, I came back, I met this man, he was still chanting, and he got a big picture of Prabhupada in his room. The second time when I went to meet him, he was gone. And they said to me, 
that they couldn't take the bead off his hand. And he just chanted. In last uh, two, three weeks of his life, he just chanted and he didn't do anything else. In the last week, he didn't even go to the bathroom or anything. He was just one place looking at Prabhupada's picture and chanting. And the last thing they have heard was his chanting in his mouth and then he left. Prabhupada sometimes would joke as we entered his room because obviously it's a very important thing when you would go into Prabhupada's room. It was always, I always considered it to be a very, the most important event to go to before Prabhupada. So often I would come into his room very, very seriously and he would sometimes sort of joke. One time I came into his room in that very serious mood and he looked up to me, looked, looked up at me and said with mock seriousness, yes, what is your message? <laughs> another time another time I came to his room in New York and uh, he was just finishing his breakfast he was in a very jolly mood and I was on a college preaching tour and he said oh Ridananda Maharaj he said you are actually traveling and preaching I'm just here eating <laughs> anyway so he was he was pleased with the college preaching tour there's another there's an interesting follow-up to that he was pleased with the college preaching tour we talked about that for a while so i was feeling very good Prabhupada likes my program and he gave me a little attention so i was feeling very happy then uh, the next day i went to Prabhupada's room thinking well here i am the college preacher and i sat in front of Prabhupada, and you know he didn't really speak to me he was just doing his business but there was a young girl just a just some innocent girl brahmacharini who was uh, changing Prabhupada's flower vases and uh, apparently with, with, with much devotion so that Prabhupada was watching her and very pleased, smiling, just, just like a, a loving grandfather is watching this young girl change the flower vases and he said to her, oh, thank you very much, what is your name? So that day, Prabhupada had, didn't have a word for me but he was rather very pleased by the devotion of this young girl. So in ISKCON, I was the sannyasi, et cetera, et cetera, and she, said just some, she was just some innocent girl, but she's the one that pleased Prabhupada at that time because I was thinking I'm a sannyasi and she was just an innocent girl serving with much devotion. So I never forgot that lesson also. Prabhupada um, liked to uh, eat fairly simply. Um, his, you know, standard fare was for breakfast he had cut fruits. Um, he would often take freshly fried uh, cashew nuts. Um, in India, sometimes we would give him a bowl of puff rice. Um, and maybe just like one small half piece of sandesh. But that was generally it for breakfast. It was very light. Um, for lunch, then he would have the standard uh, rice dal and chapati. And then added to that uh, one wet sabji, one dry sabji. Um, and again, maybe a small sweet. That was the basic. Then if the cook was good, then they could add more things to that. But those things must be there. And the chapatis, of course, Prabhupada liked them to be cooked hot. They had to be, um, you know, fresh off the stove. And he had a little bell on his table. So when you first brought the plate in, there would be one hot chapati there. And then as he finished that one, then he would ring the bell and then we would immediately puff up another one on the flames and then run in with it. We were starting this Bulla Cart Party at that time. So when the inauguration of Bulla Cart Party that day, uh, I was asked to bring some prasad and uh, to offer to Prabhupada to give for all the devotees. So I, being a stupid South Indian, so I went there and I brought coconut and gur. That's what South Indian prasad is. But these coconuts were not soft, very hard, and then the good was also not very, not good class. So I had a big plate of pieces of coconut and good. So it was brought in front of Prabhupada and you know, Prabhupada looked at, what is this? So Lokana Swami says, this is prasad for, we are starting the bulla cart today. Oh, bulla cart? Put his hand there, and he took a piece of coconut and good, small one, put in his mouth. And he was talking, the talk was about how we go about when we do the bulla cart party, what do we do? 
So uh, he was having this on one side, he kept on talking, then it will, he will move it to this side, like this, then to the, this side, to that side. This way he was keeping it, till it all melted and he could actually eat it. So I was feeling very um, uh, grateful because I was thinking that I, mu I must have, uh, I should have asked Lokna Swami, what prasad I should bring? It should have been some sandesh, because naturally this Prabhupada is so old, <laughs> and, and you know it's not something that hard should be given to him for eating. And even though it was unfit, he accepted that. Not only accepted that, you know he kept it in his mouth till he could actually eat it. It was suffering for a, for an old person to do that and talk also at the same time. And he went on explaining things and you know, keeping on changing this from one side to the other side and uh, showing that, look, I have accepted it and because you've given it with love, so I have taken it. From Australia, we went to New Zealand. So when we got to New Zealand, there was nobody available to cook there. So I was, you know, it was my first time I had to do the whole thing. So I put the cooker on the flan and uh, went back, finished the massage, came back, <laughs> and everything was totally ruined. Uh, I'd left the flame on too high, so all the dal had dried up in the bottom. This, the rice was like sludge. It, it had just, you know, disintegrated. And the vegetables were so soft that they just fell apart. And there was nothing else, and there was nobody else there to, you know, to do a quick job of cooking either. So I had to just serve what I had. So when Prabhupada saw it, he was really uh, disappointed. And he said, what's this? So I said, well, you know, I must have had the flame too high. So Prabhupada said, you are too dull. He said, you cannot cook. <laughs> so that was my first attempt. It was a disaster. And I felt really bad, actually, because um, prasadam was a very important thing for Prabhupada. His uh, digestive system at that time was very delicate and of course traveling around it was very important that he get consistent you know a consistent standard of food otherwise all kinds of physical problems would you know could come about I remember once in um, Calcutta when Palika was cooking and she was about 10 minutes late uh, with his prasadam and Prabhupada got really angry about it and he you know he demanded to see her and she came up and he really chastised her very strongly and I'd, I hadn't seen him, you know, at least chastise one of his women disciples as strong as that before. And um, so after he, you know, complained very strongly, then, um, then after that he explained, he said, when the appetite comes up, it must be fed, otherwise disease comes. So and we'd had, you know, when I was with him, I regulated the standard for serving lunch prasadam uh, to 1.30, regardless of when he finished the massage. And um, so by 1.30, of course, then he expected his prasadam to be there, and that means the thought of eating makes the juices in the stomach begin to flow, and then you have to feed it, otherwise then there's disease. So it was a science, and Prabhupada was aware of that. Apart from that, of course, Prabhupada did have problems in digesting food anyway, so it was very important uh, to give him a good standard of prasadam on a regular basis. But uh, unfortunately, I wasn't very good at it. A few months after I'd taken sannyas, I was... Uh, when you take sannyas, of course, you really have to be very serious about Krishna consciousness, because it's, it's a especially for a young man, precarious position. So I was trying very hard to be a good sannyasi. You know, I was a young sannyasi, trying hard to be Krishna conscious, and then you realize not really Krishna conscious enough as much, and Prabhupada deserves to be served much better than I felt that I'm serving him. So I was feeling a little bit in that mood, a little unhappy that I'm not serving Prabhupada properly. So, you know, I thought, well, I, I better eat less, you know, typical young man. I better... I'm sure we all went through that, so I'm not going to eat very much. So I was trying to eat very little for a few days. So one day uh, we were out in Prabhupada's garden in Los Angeles and we were coming back. Actually, every day he would come and get me because I was trying to be 
I was trying not to impose on Prabhupada, but every day as he would walk down the stairs and go out to his garden, he would stop my little sannyasram, and he would just peek in the door, just walk in, look around, and just walk out and keep going. But of course, that was the signal, and I would immediately jump off my chair and offer obeisance and run after him. So every day he would come and get me like that. So one day we were coming back from the walk, and as we got near the stairway in his quarters, just as they are now in L.A., on the radiator, I don't know, probably it's still not there, there, there was one of those old radiators there, and on top of it was a typical thing, you know, a paper plate with a big mound of leftover prasadam. You know, I don't know, you know, potatoes or rice, whatever, just a big thing like that. So probably was stopped, put his cane down, looked at it. They turned to me and just said, eat that. <laughs> <laughs> so, so much for my austerities. So then uh, I immediately offered obeisances and took the plate and ate it. I was in Prabhupada's room one time when Jadarani came in. She was, her health was not good, and she told Prabhupada she wanted to fast. And Prabhupada told her, don't fast completely, at least take fruit. He said, it's not good to fast completely. Prabhupada explained one of his strategies for making people Krishna conscious was to distribute profuse amounts of prasadam. Because they're basically people are almost like animals, you know, in this way they live. Uh, they don't know anything other than their bodies. So he said, at least let them eat prasadam. He said, then that way, they'll gradually, he said, then that's also Krishna. And they'll gradually develop an attraction to Krishna simply by eating the prasadam. And then when that develops, then they'll be able to inquire about the philosophy or they'll be able to understand the philosophy simply by eating prasadam. So he said, this is our program, that we want people to become gradually Krishna conscious. And uh, prasadam distribution was one, you know, very definite, obvious way that they could make some advancement. I think he also said personally he likes ghee. But he always said, eat what you can digest. The Prophet always said that you should eat what you can digest. The Prophet said to me, he said, if you eat what you like, it will be good for you. My parents came to see me at the manor. And... Um, Prabhupada was in London and I'd come back from London to the manor to meet with, with my parents. I hadn't seen them for about five years and they had never seen me as a devotee. So um, during the course of the afternoon I went to look for some prasadam for them and there was none. I was told, well, we have an early Sunday feast here and there's nothing left. So I was unable to give them any. Anyway, I took them around the manor and uh, I explained a bit of the philosophy, etc. They were unfortunate in that they didn't get to see Srila Prabhupada. Um, they were just about to leave because they had a four-hour drive home when Prabhupada came back from London and he came in through the gate just as we were stood there and they were, you know, saying goodbye. So they kind of got a glimpse, that was all. Um, anyway, so afterwards, they, after they'd gone, I went up to see Srila Prabhupada and he asked me, well, how did it go with your parents? So I said it was very nice, they were very favorable and you know, I showed them the deities and we looked around and you know, I explained a bit of the philosophy. So then Prabhupada said, did they get prasadam? So they said, oh, well, actually I was told there wasn't any. And Prabhupada said, oh. It was almost like, well, what was the use? You know, if they didn't get prasadam, then the whole trip was basically a failure. <laughs> so. You know, he, he put a lot of uh, emphasis on, on prasadam. It was a very practical way, uh, you know, for a person to make advancement in Krishna consciousness. And uh, my mother was always, of course, nice to me, never favorable, you know, to the movement. I mean, she was polite and respectful and all that, but not, you know, always just thinking how, I, how to get me out of this thing. Typical mother. So, uh, so I said, let's go see Prabhupada. So she went up and sat down in front of Prabhupada, and I saw her transformed, actually. She became like a little, like a young girl sitting in front of Prabhupada. And, of course, by her culture, she was very respectful and so on. Then she became like a young girl, and Prabhupada began to tell her that how fortunate she was that her son was a devotee of Krishna, and she nodded in agreement. You know, her whole life since I joined was <laughs> the opposite, but at Prabhupada's presence, she was overwhelmed, and she politely nodded in agreement. And uh, then after, she, after a few minutes, she went downstairs. And 
for the only time she ever did that, she actually opened her purse and said, can I give you something for your movement? You know, the, before his usual mantra, you know, are you sure it's just for you? <laughs> Bullockart was there. So next day when he walked around the yard, then he saw the Bullockart. We had a banner on the Bullockart which said in a semicircle like this, it said, Bhakti Vedanta, Bullockart Traveling Sankirtan Party. It says traveling Sankirtan. So Prabhupada stood there and he put his head like this and he was reading. Bhakti Vedanta Bullockart Traveling Sankirtan. <laughs> and then he said, Joy. So then he came to the bulls, fed them some grass, patted on their cheek like this. Then he said that these bulls are carrying Gaudnitai for preaching. Uh, they will go back home, back to God. They won't have another life. Prabhupada was in Caracas and we were desperately trying to get the first Spanish Bhagavatam, which was being printed in America, out of the printers and down to Caracas in time to give Prabhupada while he was still there in our zone. And he was flying from Caracas to Miami. So there were a few glitches and the book was not coming in time. So we were disappointed. Then finally, somehow rather frantic, negotiations with the printer and we arranged that uh, the book was rushed down by air freight to Caracas and it arrived the same morning Prabhupada was leaving. So we had some of our leaders there in Venezuela desperately, you know, trying to get it out of customs and South America is not always the easiest place in the world to do things like that. Meanwhile, Prabhupada went to the airport and, uh, you know, he was checked in and so on. We did all that for him. And uh, to my great dismay, the book hadn't come and Prabhupada went through the immigration check, passport check, and that was it. So just after Prabhupada had gone in, we paid obeisances and I was a little disappointed. Suddenly the book came. So uh, I became so inspired to give this first Spanish Bhagavatam to Prabhupada. I was there, of course, with a shaved head and dunda and so on. I just went running through the airport. You know, it's a South American country. There, you know, you can't just run through police checks and things like that in any country, and certainly not there either. But I was so inspired. Uh, Krishna somehow, Krishna just arranged everything, and I ran right past the passport check. No one said a word to me. Here I was shaved head in a dunda. Ran right past uh, all. There were several checkpoints. You got to show this and show that. Ran past all of them. No one said a word to me. I ran right into the waiting lounge. The International Waiting Lounge, and went down, offered obeisances, and sat next to Prabhupada. He actually he had me sit next to him. No, one, no official said a word to me, and I gave him the Bhagavatam. So Prabhupada was very pleased. He looked at it. Then he wanted to check to see if it was bona fide. So he said, "Can you translate this?" I said, from Spanish back to English. I said, "Yes, Prabhupada." So he said, "All right." So he opened to the preface and said, "Read this in English." So I read it in English. Prabhupada saw it was correct. Was bona fide, so he was very happy. And then, he, then they called him for his flight just then, and he walked off holding the Bhagavatam and got on the plane and went to Miami. I was holding the picture of Prabhupada in the front, uh, that picture with a big flower garland, and uh, Maharaj was in the back, we were all dancing, and Bulakar arrived in Mayapur temple. And um, so we went to the temple hall first and Navayogendra Swami was chanting there. Uh, and Lokanath uh, was leading the kirtan as we came in. They got together, both of them, and they had a big kirtan for another 45 minutes. By the time it was already 11 o'clock, over 11. So then Maharaj said, well, let's go and see Prabhupada. And we were all climbing up. And Hari Suri was standing there like this. He said, you can't see, you can't go now. It's 11 o'clock. What is all this nice? You keep quiet, go back. Prabhupada is tired, he's sick, and he was standing there like this. And um, and we were looking, you know, like that. Prabhupada came out of his bathroom and turned to go into his room. And he was opening the door like this, and then he just turned this way and he saw us. He said, oh, bullock cart party, come, come. And Prabhu is standing here and we are all going this way, that way, over him. 
<laughs> he's still standing there trying to stop us. At least trying to stop some of us. Everyone was in. <laughs> Papa sat down, wiped his nose like this, and he said, So, Lokanath Swami, how are you? And, and uh, he gained, he seemed to be gaining strength. And he looked very tired, but he was becoming stronger. And he had this uh, bottle of burfi. He opened that and he gave everyone one piece. And he asked, where were you last night? So Lokna Swami said, that this Gaudiya Mutt in Navadip, one Gaudiya Mutt, they charged us two rupees per head to sleep uh, in a, um, a Kirtan Mandap in front of the dairies, which had no roof. Means they were charging us for the sky. <laughs> <laughs> two rupees each per head. And Prabhupada laughed and he said, Oh, this is nothing. And he said, You know, uh, mutts, it's a big it's, it's a big thing. He said, They used to use the shalagram for cracking the bitterness. And he said, This is called mutt. Uh, and he said, This is what happens to the Brahmins. And like that. And then he said, Then he asked every single uh, after Allahabad, uh, till Mayapur, he was asking, did you go to this village? Did you meet this man there? He said, did you go to Fatehpur? Did you see that Gurnitai Bhavan, those nice deities? Did you visit there? And then it was like every single thing that, that was green in our memory, he was saying. And he said, uh, you know how I know these places? Because I have gone to every single place for preaching. He said, I was staying in Gaurnithai Bhavan. And then he was telling, oh, did he go here, did he go there? And, and he said, how did you do the Bihar side? How did you do the Bengal side? Did you, were you in Bardwan? So Lokna Swami said, yes, we came by the truck, but we got down in Bardwan and we started from there. Like that. And he was talking for a long time. Most probably he was talking for over an hour. And then he said, now that you have come to Mayapur, uh, now you should go to Puri. Like that. And that was the last thing he said. There were many stories. Then another time when we had the first Portuguese Bhagavatam, we were again, same thing, we were so eager to give this to Prabhupada. So I was taking a flight from Sao Paulo to Lima, Peru, and then on to Los Angeles. And so uh, the airport was, anyway, it was in a very strange place, and every time we went there, there, the car got lost and it got lost again and we finally arrived at the airport after the flight had already boarded and I was just we were just eternally had to get this Bhagavatam to Prabhupada so they said I'm sorry that you know the flight's closed and that's it so Mahavir was there he was also very fired up so he actually grabbed the walkie-talkie from the lady at the counter and started talking to the people on the flight and said hold that flight so they held the flight so then, uh, <laughs> then they, you know, then they said, "All right, all right, you have to hurry." So then we ran to the flight, and and it, we were so late they they wouldn't even issue a ticket there. Mahavir had to stay behind and buy the ticket. I just got on the plane. When I got to Lima, Peru, they gave me the ticket, and then I went on to Los Angeles. We met Prabhupada. He arrived that next morning. He went in his Vyasa san, spoke, and then I was so eager to give him this Bhagavatam because because it pleased him so much. Actually, you you knew that it would always please him to give him these books. So, uh, as he was getting off his Vyasa, and I couldn't wait till he got up to his room, I handed him the Bhagavatam. <laughs> so then we finally went up to his room, and he, he looked at me and said, This is your most, most important service uh, printing and distributing books. So, when he said that, those words, I felt went deep into my heart. It was a very, actually, a very important moment for me uh, when he said that. So, but you could always please Prabhupada that way. I had the experience of being the GBC of all of Latin America. And of course, we had so many projects. There were all kinds of things going on, you can imagine. And yet, when I would go to see Prabhupada, the first question would always be, so, how is the Sankirtan? How many books are being distributed? You would ask that question. Shri Vashadi Gaur Bhakta Bhakta